Hello friends, today we are going to discuss about estimatory capacity. I am Dr. Suresh Badadmat, Professor of Psychiatry, working at Nimans, Bangalore. Before I start my presentation, I would like to have a disclaimer. This presentation is for academic and training purpose only. This video is not an alternate for legal opinion. If you want to have a legal opinion, please do contact an advocate. Conflict of interest? None. In this video, I am going to discuss about the definition of capacity and also testamentary capacity. At the same time, we will discuss one of the important celebrity case titled as John Banks vs. Goodfellow which was decided in 1870. This decision is relevant even today. And we are going to close this video by discussing the components of the testamentary capacity. And this video is helpful for psychiatrists, neurologists, neurosurgeons, medical practitioners, patient and family members, advocates and judges. Let's discuss about testamentary capacity. All human beings are born with free, autonomous and equal across the world. And this autonomous is a very essential component. The autonomy to decide is a very important human right. Although this has not been read in the fundamental rights of our Indian constitution, but many of the Supreme Court judgments talk about right to self-determination. That means every person has a right to decide the way he wants to live his life, the way he wants to deal with his property and his, even his body. Hence, the capacity becomes very essential to make decision. So, capacity to decide is a very essential component in many cases wherever a person with mental illness or a person having a neurological illnesses or else dementia where he has to decide about his property or he has to give consent regarding his any intervention for the purpose of treatment. In such a scenario, capacity plays a very essential role. In this video, we are focusing on testamentary capacity. Let's understand the meaning of capacity. Capacity means ability to do a particular thing. But mental capacity means it is the ability to make a particular decision at the time it needs to be made, that is at relevant time as per WHO. Let's understand moving a one step ahead decision making capacity. If a person can demonstrate the understanding of the situation, appreciation of the consequences of their decision and reasoning in their thought process and if, and if they can communicate their wish, that means that person has decision making capacity. That means he can give valid informed consent. At the same time, legally he can enter into any contract. So that is what his testamentary capacity means. Capacity is the basis for all informed consent. Only that, capacity is an essential component in testamentary capacity. Now the question is, should capacity to be assessed every time we take informed consent or else when a person enters into a contract? It's not required. By default, the law clearly says everyone has capacity and anybody challenges it should prove that the person doesn't have capacity. A formal capacity assessment should be done only if there is a reason to believe the patient's decision-making abilities are lost because of mental illness or neurological illness such as dementia or else delirium or various other reason. In such a scenario, the capacity assessment should be done. Let's understand the full clinical concept of cap capacity. Capacity is a clinical concept assessed by clinician and it is task specific and it is highly dynamic and it is time specific because a person who has capacity to decide what breakfast he wants to have in the morning may not have the same capacity next day morning because of the brain disorder. A person with a dementia may have the capacity in the morning but as the sundowning effect he may lose his capacity to decide for a specific task. Hence, capacity is a dynamic in nature and a clinical construct and it is a spectrum that means 
a person who has capacity to decide for a specific task may have a capacity but he may not have capacity to decide for other task that means it is a clinical construct and it is a spectrum at the same time the person loses capacity and he may regains as the treatment progresses so be very clear capacity is a clinical construct but at the same time there is one more definition or one more concept that is called as competence you need to differentiate between capacity and competence competence is a legal term pronounced by the court the court decides whether a person is competent or incompetent if the court decides a person is incompetent that means he is not a legally valid person he cannot enter into any contract and he cannot give any consent the reason being is any consent taken from an invalid person will be considered as invalid consent again the court has to declare that he is competent when he regains competency competence is all or none phenomena capacity is not capacity is highly dynamic and it changes every day every hour so capacity being a clinical construct the clinician need to assess let's enter into the testamentary capacity for the first time how in john banks versus goodfellow case how the judge decided please remember this case came into picture in 1870 let's understand the facts of the case john banks was born in 1812 and within a short period of time by the age of 26 27 he had a huge amount of property he had 15 cottages and earned money since there was nobody the only brother and sister was there his sister named margaret banks so what he does the john banks writes a will in his sister name that was in 1838 you can see both the father and mother are not there the john banks that is mr john banks is a rich person writes the will in the name of his sister margaret banks in 1838 unfortunately in 1841 mr banks develops psychosis here he develops a delusion of persecution against mr featherstone alexander although the featherstone alexander dies within few years but mr john banks continues to hold delusion of persecution thinking that he is alive or else he is coming in the form of a devil and trying to molest him this is his delusion and in 1843 he was admitted he was admitted in the hospital for a period of 1 year and at the same time what happens is margaret banks gets married to thomas goodfellow and they have a child they name the child as margaret goodfellow she is a female child as soon as the child is born unfortunately margaret banks expires because of the complication with regard to childbirth now tom's good fellow gets married to another lady and has a one more child a male child called as jacob good fellow now mr john banks has returned home now he writes the will in the name of margaret good fellow his sister's daughter she is his niece once he writes the will within 2 years the john banks dies and again margaret good fellow she is around 18 years old now she is having the, all the property in her name now jacob good fellow challenges the will written by john banks telling that he is mentally ill and when the bill when the will was executed he was suffering from mental illness that is the contention of the whole case during the contention what did the judgment by brett judge did brett judge what he does is with the help of the juror he gives a pronouncement by telling that the will is valid although john banks may be suffering from mental illness but his capacity was preserved and the case was appealed to the high court the four judges of the court of queens bench in westminster hall it was decided 
and the chief justice sir alexander cockburn decides the case and appeals the decision of john bretsey and he says this case is a very important milestone and the will was upheld and in the decision they brought in five important components he says the tester must be the tester means the person who is executing the will the person who has a property he is writing a will he is called as a tester a tester must be capable of understanding the act of making a will and its effect if you are writing a will you should know what is writing a will and its effect if you write a will the second important point is the tester must be capable of understanding the nature and extent of the property relevant to the disposition here there were 15 cottages which were the owner was john banks he was able to understand that he is writing this property in the name of his niece that knowing the nature and the extent of the property is the second important point third one is the tester must be capable of evaluating the claims of those who might be expected to benefit from this estate and able to demonstrate an appreciation of the nature of any significant conflict or complexity in the context of tester's life situation it's basically who is going to benefit and who is not going to benefit what are the reasons for taking the such a decision to execute a will that reasoning capability should be preserved further the tester must be capable of community communicating a clear consistent rationale of the distribution of their property that is the rationale especially if there has been a significant departure from previously expressed wish or prayer wills if it is there see this is a very important point the reasoning power is brought in here in the point number 4 in the point 5 free of mental disorders including delusion that influences the distribution of the estate in John Banks case, although he had a delusion against Mr. Alexander, but that delusion did not come in the way of execution of the will. Hence, the will was considered as valid. And one more important golden rule was bought subsequently in 1977. In this, they clearly said that if someone is going to challenge the validity of the will in future, for example, if you are treating a person with mental illness or else, if you are treating a person with dementia, that person is going to make a valid will. In the process of making a valid will, there is a golden rule. The golden rule is the making of a will to be witnessed or approved by a medical practitioner who satisfies himself of the capacity and understand of the tester and records and preserves his examination and findings. This golden rule is applied then the testamentary capacity will be upheld. So, this golden rule holds very good in UK. To summarize, my dear friends, Bank vs. Goodfellow test in 1870 is a landmark decision which is even applied now also. This case heralded the notion that capacity is not diagnosis bound. It is an independent clinical construct assessed by a clinician. And there is no assumption about capacity can be made from a diagnosis of mental illness. Just somebody has diagnosis of mental illness or dementia, you cannot say that they do not have capacity. And also, mental capacity is task specific and also time specific and dynamic in nature. Hence, whenever a, cap a will is executed, the assessment has to be done and within a short period, the will has to be executed. To conclude, my dear friends, the tester should know the making of the will and its effect, the extent of the property which they are disposing, and be able to comprehend and appreciate the claim to which they are out to give an effect. At the same time, even if he has a mental disorder, it should not come in the way of disposition of the will. And the golden rule of having a medical practitioner examining the person who is executing the will and he can be a witness plays a crucial role thank you very much for giving your valuable time stay safe